Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Emory Jones. In a few days before our next live stream, we'll know if the most important uncommitted prospect is actually going to commit to LSU. And I'm telling you, I'm feeling pretty good about it. So obviously, this is going to be a big uh, topic. We're going to get into Max Johnson and Miles Brennan. It's very interesting, even though it is very early, uh, that so far, our poll, Miles Brennan had the better 2020 based on film. We say hi to Jared. We say hi to Mick. We say hi to Al. As always, Venmo Cash App Super Chat is the best way to get your question out front. And here's a cool thing about tonight. Okay. So, obviously, I don't even know if Jared saw this in our episode earlier today. Jared was also the human being that... Uh, just happened to win this Joe Burrow card. And in our last live stream, we also, and this was very key as well, in our last live stream, we also had something very fascinating. What's up, Creek? Carter is in the chat. Let's go. But this was really interesting. This really made me so happy earlier today. You know, I had a few other people say, hey, I want to win a card. Hey, I want to win a card. Hey, I want a bugger bracelet. So I appreciate all the support. I appreciate all the cash apps and the super chats. And here's the thing, people. The season is right around the corner. So I'm really going to need you because I think PHL, I think we can have 200 people in every live chat during the season. <laughs> Max says, if Emory Jones goes to Bama, you owe me the super chat. Ooh. Max, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Creek, I'm great, man. How are you? How's life in Shreveport today? And Max, guess what? You get to pick the topic. If you want to talk Emory Jones, we'll talk Emory Jones. If you want to talk Max Johnson and Miles Brennan, we'll do that as well. Uh, let's see. It's hot in Shreveport. It's hot everywhere. So uh, for those that don't know, uh, this live chat is starting a little bit later. Uh, it is simply because uh, it wasn't a doctor's appointment that I had to go to. My mother uh, had to go to a doctor's appointment, so I was on the road today. Uh, it was why I wasn't available really to chat during the John Emery piece a little bit uh, earlier, so I'm sorry about starting this uh, just a little bit late. Some of the scores in your film study were almost uh, depressing. Uh, I don't think so. Here, here's the thing. You know what? I kind of, I kind of, I don't regret anything that that I post, um, Pegasus. But uh, my mom is perfectly fine. She would hate that I even shared that. Uh, she hates the attention being on her at all. Uh, she is super low key, uh, but yes, yeah, she is in wonderful health. So I'm really glad you asked. It does make me feel good. Um, but I, I do want to share this, and and this is. Very key. The main reason why I did that piece earlier today is you like if I'm doing a film study and I share with you comments um, in the film study like we did earlier with the John Emery, I got that message so many times. And I used to think that as well, that the running back rotation wasn't great. Um, but a big reason why you can't have the same running back out there is if you blow an assignment in pass protection, that to me is the imp the equivalent of a 20-yard run except in the opposite direction. What's up, Esteban? Esteban got his card uh, in the mail, and he got his booger bracelets, one for 10, two for 15, three for 20. And uh, Esteban got a card of LSU legend Michael Brockers. We go to Max's super chat here. How about we appreciate Max Johnson's leadership and Moxie in a broken season on pretty much an all-freshman starting just team? Our fan. Oh, you just got our fan? Mm -hmm. Perfect. And it's also got an air conditioner in it. Oh, it's got an air conditioner in it the fan? It's $90. Is it 90 
Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it will help. So, can I go ahead and bring her in here? When, since y'all started late tonight, I, no, 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 no. Everyone say out of Z. She's going to go to bed soon. She's been acting a little better. Well, she was locked up today. And once Michael Brocker's H Town's finest. Her, let me have her. Wanna? So I, I'll share this with you guys. And, and this is very key. So you guys are getting to see Z early tonight. Um, and, and Max, big Al, big Al. I've got, I've got to say, you're right. When I went back and watched the film, and I've done a full film study on Max Johnson and Miles nice, Brennan. Roger. The most recent um, film study that I did was on, um, was on Miles Brennan a few months ago. So how about we do this? I I'll do a film study on Max Johnson and show you what I like and what I didn't like. But to the point that Max made, and this is so key, is... Max Johnson performed at such a high level when nothing went his way. His pass protection was shaky. Uh, his blocking from the tight end position was shaky. He didn't have Eric Gilbert. He didn't have Terrace Station Marshall. Tonight. He didn't have any of the key pieces that Miles Brennan had earlier when? in the season. And the fact that Max Johnson was still able to perform at the no, level that he played was simply incredible. Look at all that melanin. You know it, Kane. You know it. Um, look at that face. Look at that. Huh? Ow. Ah. She bit your nose. It's okay. It's okay. You almost she we almost got demonetized for this I live said, stream. Shh. Shh. Huh? 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 Get the mic. Get the booger mic. Get, lick the mic and then go do your thing. Look at her. She just she's starts doing she's huh? Huh? Z huh? is so huh? sweet huh? looking. Huh? Her looks are deceiving. It is. She is a feisty one. We'll put it like that. She's feisty because that was probably my Amazon order, baby doll. Was it? It was Esteban sending uh, right. twenty. So guess what? Esteban needs three more bracelets. There you go, man. Huh? Uh -huh. I so want to see people with their booger bands. Well, Esteban still hasn't pictures. sent us a photo. I asked Esteban to send me a photo uh, of this. No, so Esteban, thank you for your super chat. And we are also going to give you another LSU card. You don't know who it's going to be. I kind of want to make it a Texas Tiger because I know how much those guys mean to you. So for those that don't know, I hooked Esteban up with uh, a cool Michael Brockers card. Um, so, yeah, we'll we'll take care of that. All right, everyone say bye to Z. Uh-oh, let's have update information. Hello. Bye, bye Z. Love you. So, Esteban, thank you so much. We will get those in the mail for you. So, Esteban got three more. And these are all we have left. I ordered a limited supply. I wanted to see how well they're selling. They are actually selling well. Um, yeah, Max, we're, we're doing well. I uh, Once again, this is where I make most of my money is uh, your donations. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Kane, it is very simple. I don't have an online store set up yet. You just send me a Venmo or Cash App. Um, uh, one for 10, two for 15, three for 20 and Kane, um, I'll DM you and we'll get your address and we'll get it out to you, uh, pretty quickly. The master blaster is here and Max, uh, hooked us up with a nice little super chat a little bit earlier and, um, Esteban, we're going to get your bracelets out tomorrow. Cool stuff, man. I'm really excited about the bracelets. What's really cool about the bracelets is that uh, we get to honor Bug the Dog. And if you get three bracelets, you do get an LSU card, which is the best part about it. Esteban, I'm telling you, got the hookup. Now, uh, we're also going to do this tonight. Um, the next person uh, to get a shirt... Uh, we'll get a booger bracelet as well. So next person that buys a shirt, I'll send you a booger bracelet as well. Two is one dollar. Two is one dollar. Uh, well, yeah, one one for ten, two for fifteen, three for twenty. If you get three for twenty, you get uh, an LSU card of some sort. Um, 
And uh, we, we actually just sent out uh, some bracelets to JJ. He's not in here right now. Um, JJ got a Terrace Marshall uh, uh, card, which is obviously really cool. So, yeah. One, but, Kane, I know you don't like cards because you've won a card on here before, and you were very nice uh, to, to give it away to someone else. So, uh, you know, this is just such a key question to me. Max Johnson, Miles Brennan, when it comes down to the film, Miles Brennan looks like a better quarterback, and part of it is because of the arm strength. Um, part of it is because of the verticality to the passing game. Max Johnson, there's nothing really too flashy about his game, right? He doesn't have a Mahomes kind of whip on his throw. He doesn't make these crazy one-footed throws on the run uh, like a Garrett Nussmeyer uh, uh, that, that we've seen him do on high school tape. He's not – he's left-handed, but and he's mobile, but he's not Michael Vick, right? He's um, – Obviously, uh, really, really, really mobile. And Jared hooked this up uh, with uh, a $20. So Jared just ordered himself three more bands. We might sell out tonight. I'm pretty excited about it. So that's the thing. I really do believe what Max Johnson did. And and honestly, you know, I went back and I watched the, the two games over and over. And I thought... When I would watch the the replay, I thought it would show me that Max Johnson wasn't as impressive because we won both of the games and we were caught up in the emotion and it was such a rough season and we were able to end the season two and zero. So I thought when I rewatched the games that Max would be less impressive, and I honestly said that and I said it on the live streams multiple times. But now after re-watching it so many times over, and I'm at the do a film study on the throws that Max Johnson missed, even with the throws that he missed, I'm still so blown away by what he was able to accomplish. Um, okay, perfect, Kane. Yeah, okay. Uh, there weren't many people on the channel that love Bug more, more than Kane. Um and Booger loved you back. So, yeah, it, it is very interesting. Like, whenever you actually go back and you see all the assignments that were blown, yes, Max did miss some throws. Uh, the Ole Miss game wasn't as good as the Florida game. Those are, are truths. With that said, though, only one bad interception in the red zone. It did happen in the fourth quarter. Yes, most of his production the entire season came at the hands of Keishon Butte, which is also a little bit of a concern. But still, even when you factor all of that in, what he did last season, even if he's not the starter, I would have to say, when you factor in context, Max Johnson's film was better than that of Miles Brennan. Now, from an NFL perspective, where the verticality of, of, of your passing game is paramount for a successful NFL offense to run, then, of course, Miles Brennan is going to be your better option. But here's a good thing. <laughs> you don't have to have a big arm to win a lot of games at the college level. In fact, we've seen a ton of Heiser Trophy winning quarterbacks that didn't have rocket arms. So we'll see. Um, Max equal equals to Tebow. Um, arm wise, yes. Uh, athleticism, no. <laughs> Tebow was really next level. Um, but it is interesting because Miles Brennan, as Carvis points out, his Missouri game was so special. The Mississippi State game was not that great. It was his first start. He still made a lot of plays in that game. The Vanderbilt game, it was Vanderbilt. I thought it was okay in that game. A lot of the throws were just look at Terrace Marshall, throw it. Uh, one of his touchdowns was a flea fl flicker, but the Missouri game was really good. And 
Miles did make a lot of throws in that game on the run, and he didn't have a whole lot of help. So, um, yeah, uh, you could make the case that Miles did have the better film, though. It's really close. It's really close. Now, that's a different question than who should be your starter because obviously both of these quarterbacks in 2020 aren't going to be the same player that they were in 2021. So we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. But based on what I've seen on rewatches, yes, Miles stretches the field a lot better than Max does. But some of the things that Max did to win those games against Florida and Ole Miss were really impressive. I think you're right, Carvis. I it would have been interesting to see, you know, the rest of the season, right? I think a key aspect to that is obviously, and and this is going to be a sore subject, but I'll, I'll bring it up because it is important to bring up in the context of this conversation. Um, Eric Gilbert's season would have been a lot better if Miles still would have been the guy, because Miles and Eric Gilbert <laughs> were a perfect tandem. Eric is a vertical tight end. And Miles is a vertical thrower, and we saw that in the Missouri game. And that was a game where Eric really balled out. He regressed after that. He had a bad drop against Arkansas that would have been a long touchdown. But honestly, you know, there, there was some real connection between the two of them in that game. Um, but, you know, it is it is so close. <laughs> like, you know, one week you'll see – you know, pro football focus, they'll have Max Johnson, or excuse me, they'll have Miles Brennan in their top five quarterbacks, period, right? Then you'll see a different list where Max Johnson, I saw Cole Kubelik list his five best quarterbacks in the SEC. Max Johnson was number three. And I think there is a larger point to this, right? The Bigger point that we tend to forget in college football is that I don't know if Miles and Max's situation is as uncommon as we probably think. It's just it's so often that a quarterback goes down and we see a backup quarterback come in and then both of those quarterbacks are back the next season, right? Normally, when you get Wally Pitt, uh, you 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 go. You're going to the NFL. You're going somewhere else. But what made this in- situation so interesting is that they both came back the next season. Uh, a good example of this is think about all the great quarterbacks that we've seen in college football, right? And all these great quarterbacks <laughs> were followed by even better backup quarterbacks. Right, you think about the the Urban Meyer teams, right? Um, they had Chris Leak, <laughs> who was really good. Then Tebow was even better, and then Tebow's backup, of course, was Cam Newton, who was even better than him. Then you know you you think about Ohio State. Ohio State had um, all these great quarterbacks, and their best one was a backup who never started, who luckily went to LSU, <laughs> right? I think LSU situation is good and bad. It's unfortunate that miles ever went out uh, because we wouldn't know anything about Max Johnson now. And miles would be the guy going into this next season. If he didn't go to the NFL after last season, which he wouldn't have. Um, So yeah, it it is such an, we, we think it's such an interesting situation but it honestly is it. Think about all the great quarterbacks that have played at the college level and think about all the backups. Think about all the guys that followed them. There have been so many talented backups where it is so uncommon that two winning, really good quarterbacks have both proven themselves at the division one level. And then you're having to decide between the two of them. Uh, Jared with the super chat says miles will be great this year. That's the thing. 
Oh yeah, by the way, I know a few of you want to see it. Horns down, baby. This is going to be so much fun. Okay? And I didn't want this live chat to be about Texas and Oklahoma the entire time. Um but I have a feeling that it's going to be because we did have that statement. Once again, I've been on the road uh, most of the day. So, um I don't know. Honestly don't know uh too much as far as the latest with this. I do know that we officially had the applications and it looks as if 2025 is going to be the year um, uh, for Texas and Oklahoma. Bruce, that's bold. If Max starts at 2021 and goes nine and three or 10 and two, we're starting in 2022 and LSU wins the natty. Let me ask you this. Okay. How many of you feel What's up, Jonathan? Good to hear from you. How many of you feel that the, and, and this is key, I'm really going to need your help. As we say hi to King Ulysses in Denver. Esteban, okay, before I say this, I know no one in this chat is more fired up about Texas joining the SEC than Esteban. I also know, because Esteban has to live around a bunch of Texas fans, I just know that if, Texas does beat us. Esteban is going to cry, <laughs> right? I think we'll all be sad. Miles 2021, Max 2022, Nusser Howard 2023. Let me ask you this, okay? How many of you feel the national championship window is right now? How many of you feel that this is the year, right? Because 2022, we'll be getting year three of Bryce Young. Um, you know, Florida's rebuilding. Alabama's rebuilding. Um, we get a bunch of favorable matchups at home this year. How many of you feel this year? Because this seems to be a common theme that I hear is that, well, 2022 will probably, will probably be better served. Tevin said either one of the years. Max, who super chatted earlier, he said, look, I don't care who's back there. If our offensive line doesn't block, we have no chance. Yeah, and and this kind of it's ironic that earlier we had the pass protection breakdown with John Emery and the the first play featured Miles Brennan doing a good job of pulling a Joe Burrow, making something out of nothing when protection broke down. <laughs> Roger, wow. Huh? Huh? Nuts will win two natties. Who who was the last Division I quarterback to win two natties? I guess that would be... Let's see. That would be Mac... Jones, Mac Jones won two natties because he was a backup in 2016. And but yeah, Nuss can win two natties. Yeah, I, I would I would say Mac Jones, right? Ahmad, where have you been? Like we're for real, Ahmad. What, what's up? Yeah, Carvis, it's possible. There's a lot of things that, that Nuss needs to work on. I think one of the things is, you know, obviously his playmaking ability is unbelievable, right? But he is not a year one guy, might not be a year two guy, might be more of a year three guy, which is not a criticism at all. Um, the one quarterback stat at LSU, and a lot of you have seen this video, that perfectly correlates with LSU quarterbacks since the turn of the century is starting in year three. Every quarterback at LSU who became the full-time starter from year three on in their progressions all turned out to be good. Every LSU quarterback who has started year two and back were not good. So, you know, waiting until year three is not the end of the world. You mature. Uh, it's a very complex position. So, 
yeah, you know, I, I can easily see people thinking Nuss is more talented than Max. I also think there are some things Nuss needs to, to, to get out of his game. You know, the, the one thing I see is he is a really good athlete. He's good at buying time and making plays. It's just some of the things he can get away with in high school, he's not going to get away with in um, individual in college. Uh, stepping up at the pocket is another thing that uh, he's going to have to work on a lot. And um, stepping up, throwing the ball on time is going to be huge uh, for his progression as well. And it's hard to really get reps at that unless you actually play games. So hopefully, you know, LSU gets in a few blowouts this season and it it is going to be interesting. Let's say LSU gets in a few blowouts this season and Max is the starter. Um, would it be better in garbage time to play Miles or Nuss? Um, you know, you can argue Nuss deserves those garbage time snaps. What's up? You should get to hear from you. Uh, Nuss reminds me of a smaller Josh Allen. And th- there's some similarities. I, I I could see that. God, Josh Allen is so dang. He he. Josh Allen is Tebow, but actually good at throwing. Uh, if you if you want a good um, uh, comparison there, AJ McCandoff. I like that. McCarron. He's lasted in the NFL though, and. AJ McCarron also produced the horniest broadcaster moment of all time. Who remembers the broadcaster? Okay, let's see how let's see how college football your knowledge is. Which broadcaster said uh, a very interesting thing during a broadcast featuring AJ McCarron? Let's see if let, let's see if you guys know your sports media. <laughs> no, it was. I, I don't think it was CBS DRC. I think it was. Um, I'm trying to see. I, I think I remember who it is. I, I don't. Was it Vern? I thought it was. Wait, hold on. I thought it was uh, Musburger. Hold on. Let me see. Uh, yes, it was Mus. Huh? 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 I love it. It was Mus. Yes. <laughs> Ahmad said it was me. Hey, it was Mus. You guys remember that? Man, I, I'm. Uh, Mus had some crazy calls, right? For all the Tostitos <laughs> for the game winning kick. Uh, in defense, though. In defense, right, right. <laughs> Her name was uh Catherine Catherine uh Webb. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> There's a photo uh of Mus. I'm looking at this photo right now of Mus. There was a college basketball fan who went up to Mus before a game, and it was a picture of Catherine Webb in a bikini. Mus signed it and wrote on there, she's a 10. Huh? I love it, man. Must. <laughs> that Pegasus is like, I get it. You didn't deserve heat for it. Oh, man. Must. Quinn, what's good? I love it. AJ is making Chevy. Yeah, I mean, he's a national championship winning quarterback in Alabama. He's from Alabama. Might as well cut those ads. Him. Oh, man. But anyway. Keith, oh, yeah, Keith Jackson. Whoa. I mean, God, what a legend. Anyway, uh, 61 people in here. I My girlfriend got on me about this. I need to do the like shout out more often because they do get more likes when I say, uh, you know, it, it costs nothing to like. By the way, we have sold six bands tonight. Once they are gone, I would have to get another shipment in. Um, 
So make sure uh, you take advantage of that. So, you know, I, I want to get into a, a little bit of recruiting here. All right, really quickly. I do think Emory Jones is going to be so key. Something else that the Emory Jones commitment is going to do for LSU is it will calm down the nerves. And and look, recruiting is a nervous building or a, a, a nervous process. I think it will help out a lot with the nerves of the recruiting staff to get Emory Jones locked in because that will get LSU to 16 commitments. Okay. Now let's say a few decommit before the season. I could very well see it. I think if Emory Jones does commit, LSU will lead into this next college football season with at least 14 or 15 commitments, no less than 12. So what does that tell you? LSU is going to have most of their recruiting class done before the season, right? And to me, that's key. I think a big help last season was getting that class on board before last season even began. Okay. Uh, and, and they really did close strong, especially if Bryce, Bryce Langston turns out to be a ball player. So we'll, we'll see. You know, yeah, I think Pegasus, uh, the, the, the key is Emory Jones. And then after that, Julian Armella is the one that has the most steam. I do know LSU is not going to give up on the Donovan Campbells of the world. I don't think they're going to give up on Kelvin Banks, but we'll see. Black Mamba. He is also a Nuss fan. I like it. Uh, let's see. So, you know, I we'll, we'll see. And Grant, that may not be saying a whole lot there. So, yeah, you know, we, it's so hard to really even say if Brad Davis is, is the answer to this huge issue. Also, and we, we tend to forget this as well, the nature of college football is such a weird beast, okay? And I think we're going to see this season if Ed Orgeron is a real coaching talent, right? Because he, here's, here's something that I hear a lot of, right? Well, he, he lost all the players. And yes, he did lose all the players before last season. Guess what? Um, those excuses uh, it won't be there. Now, what I'm looking forward to is how Ed Orgeron coaches with a bunch of first-year coaches, right? I think the first-year coaching hires are going to be really good. I honestly do feel this way. You guys know, I think a lot of you are here to watch this channel because I, I'm honest in my evaluations. I do like the the coaching hires, right? I, I don't say that to make you feel good about it, just to make you feel good about it. I also think one thing I don't want to hear is, well, you know, these are two coordinators. This is their first year doing it. And, you know, we got to, we got to cut them some slack, which is true. You got to cut the coordinators some slack, but you can't cut Ed Orgeron really that much slack, right? Because these were two coordinator hires that he made, more so the Jake Peets hire than the Durante hire because Jake Peets was essentially LSU's first option. Um, so, yeah, because you look at the other great coaches, um, the other great coaches win when their coordinators leave anyway, right? So this is a huge year for Ed Orgeron. You know, last year, I think most people who are rational didn't go around saying, one year wonder, one year wonder. It's the dumbest criticism I think I've ever heard. But now <laughs> you, you do feel the pressure begin to mount. And there are some things that Ed Orgeron needs to work on. But I do like the coaching staff, and I still do believe in Coach Ordron going into next season. So we'll see. What's up, Paris? Good to hear from you. 
You're an hour early, Paris. I love it. Even though, you know, Paris, I want to give you credit. I'm glad the tire got fixed for the last live stream. Also, something else is Paris is in the live stream before an hour, which is a record. I love it. But we did start the live stream at 8 Central. <laughs> I love messing with Paris. It's, it's, not, everyone gets so excited when Paris joins in. Uh, but welcome. The tire saga from Saturday was epic. And I'm glad uh, you made it home safe. Uh, what makes a good coach? That's a good question. Uh, I think what's interesting about coaching is there's so many different ways you can do it. So we'll see. You know what, King? And listen, that's a good point. Uh, the safety room or nickel will lead. Ah, uh, Paris. Huh? Don't worry. Haley does the same thing. You get scrolling on TikTok. <laughs> huh? It's hard to compete with TikTok. It's a great app. Dude, there's some content creators on there that are crazy. Um, But King Ulysses makes a good point. The safety room or the nickel will lead in picks. Quarterbacks will avoid the outside as much as possible. I also think, and, and this is really key as well, I also uh, think, and, and this, you know, I, it was mind-blowing because during the season, I didn't really watch the defensive backs all that much in my film studies because I feel as if unless you have all 22, you can't really judge the defensive back play. However, I was able to get my hands on LSU versus Florida all 22. And from that, I was able to piece together very simple coverage concepts that LSU ran last season. And as you guys saw on past defense week, we were able to break it down, you know, really deeply. Honestly, I, I really do feel if LSU just plays more conservatively with their safeties, they'll be a lot better. Now, a lot of you know, one of my favorite Tigers is Jacoby Stevens. He's great. I think he has a, a great attitude. I think starting, you know, as a five-star safety, you know, Grant Delpit was better than him. But he waited his turn. He's a great Tiger. Uh, no Louisiana ties. Came into the program and, you know, is a great special teamer and just a good player all around. But last year was such a bad fit for what he did well. And Bo Pelini never fixed it. So we'll see. Amacat comes in. <laughs> yeah, the Tom Brady video is very real. And I think Drew Brees should try it. I think Drew Brees can do it because Drew Brees is more accurate than Tom Brady. If you don't believe the Tom Brady video is real, then you're my then then I don't want you watching this. I I of course it's real, along with Santa and the Tooth Fairy, and Oklahoma winning a national championship in the college football playoff. All those things are weird and real. Oh, Tony's bringing up the Mustang package, baby. The um, John Chavis Mustang package, the 326. So filthy. That was such a fun defense to watch, right? You know, obviously, Tyron Matthew deserves all the praise. He was by far the, the best player on the team. That lets you know how good he was. Because, you know, I was Brandon Taylor, Morris Claiborne, Daryl Simon. Derek Bryant coming off the bench. That was a really good group. But who can forget? And I got to shout out my guy Esteban again. Another great Texas Tiger. Ron freaking Brooks. Love me some Ron Brooks. Um, um, you know what's interesting? I, I got to know Ron really well in college. 
and I really enjoyed him. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed getting to getting to know him, and and um, and his NFL career was pretty solid. So we'll see. Black Mamba, you need to start Sage Ryan. Sage is a beast. I don't think you should start him day one. I think that's asking a lot. I'll share what I think will happen with the LSU secondary. I am a big Todd Harris guy. Todd Harris's end of the season was really good. He is an underrated tackler in space, and I know he blew that tackle against Mississippi State. That was bad. But I do think LSU is going to want to get a little more athletic there. And that's where Sage Ryan can step in. That's where Major Burns can step in. I also think Matthew Langlois is someone else that could step in as well. You know, I, I've always shared my bias towards Matthew Langlois, three-star Louisiana kid, three-star New Roads kid, my mom's family grew up in New Roads. It means a lot that small town Louisiana kid gets the the offer. I'm still going to stand by saying he's not a true freshman year one guy. Not many guys normally get that label from me, but you know, I <laughs> I look at his measurables, look at his tape. Sub 11, 100 meter. That's pretty fast. Um, played multiple positions. Ball skills. Can give you some coverage uh, in, in man coverage as well. So if you need him to step up and, and guard a slot, he'll, he'll do it. And you do get a lot of value on, on special teams, even though it's not defense. I do. I, I can see a scenario where he plays a lot. I can't. Uh, yeah, Ron Brooks was so good. So, yeah, it, that's something that's really good about this incoming freshman class for LSU is they are really fast. There are four guys in the class that have uh, just four off the top of my head. So Armani Goodwin is probably the fastest. And then, you know, Chris Hilton and Sage Ryan and Matthew Langlois, they're – They've got real speed, like obviously not, you know, trend and holiday level, but, you know, he's, you know, God tier in that aspect, but they're, they're really, really, really fast players. Eric, what's good, man? Eric, uh, I got to call, I got to call out Eric. Eric will come and say what's up and then just leave. And Eric yeah, I'm telling you, Eric's the biggest Nuss and Chris Hilton fan on this channel. Yeah, Black Mamba. It's interesting that the recruiting reporters really thought Sage Ryan was going to go to Alabama. And I remember I, I did a video about it. I mean, there was I, – I had no insight on the Sage Ryan thing. I did get a message the night before from someone really close to him. Um, that Sage was going to LSU. And I kind of blocked it out because it was an LSU game day. Um, I believe he committed the day of the LSU-Auburn game, and I just didn't even want to think about it. Like I was like, okay, I, he's committing on a day where there's an actual game, and you know, I was so focused in. I get so focused in on the games. And all that week, I was hearing Sage Ryan, Alabama, Everybody was flipping their crystal balls, and I was like, what? Really? This is He is such a critical piece. Eric is a Paris Hilton fan? <laughs> ah, ah. Uh, Chris Norman? Why I never get a shout-out from you? Well, there you go. Uh, let's see. I have gotten a few messages about, you know, uh, what about Eli Ricks? Why don't, why don't we use them like we use Tyron Matthew? Um, yes, Eli Ricks had the pick six 
um, against Florida playing the slot corner. LSU used a box technique, and it was ridiculous. We did a full film study on the pick six itself, and if you want to break down of the coverage schemes and all of that, uh, you can watch it uh, on the channel. Just go to my page, and you'll find it. Um, it was from a few months ago. Eric says, I'm a fan of both. Huh? Huh? Ah. So, look. I, I I I think Eli Ricks has the capability of, of being one of the best LSU corners of all time. I do think playing the slot full time is a little bit different. I also don't think we'll ever see another Tyron Matthew again. You know, I did get a message saying, well, you know, if we put him in the slot, Eli Ricks as a blitzer and and all of that. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's what he wants to do, per se. What's up, Trey? We needed a super chat. We went on a little bit of a drought. What's up, Trey? How you doing? Better late than never. Let's go. Trey, one of our... Uh, our resident anthropologist. This is key. Every LSU football channel or just every YouTube channel in general needs an anthropologist. So, yeah. Late crew in this thing. So, the late crew is made up of Paris, Trey, and Eric, loyal PHLers. I love it. Better late than never. Hey, you know what? We we hang out. That's what we do, man. Not going to lie today, guys. I had a delicious. You know, uh, it's weird. I'm low-key a big burger guy. I don't like getting burgers, though, when, like, I'm, I'm traveling. Uh, I had a burger today. It had, like, this spicy jelly on it and it was excellent it was blue cheese and this jelly and some um some garlic fries it was pretty solid man i love a good burger trey you gotta rewatch the beginning i know <laughs> big out i mean god big out just quit with these dad jokes <laughs> i'm not gonna lie big out that out of all your dad jokes, I would like you to go compile all your dad jokes, Big Al, as a treasurer of PHL. I'm surprised, Big Al, you're not getting like Rodney Dangerfield type of applause for that dad joke. You never hear about oh, <laughs> that is so bad. Oh my God, but it's so good. Clinton Cheryl, what's good? But yeah, so I think as far as the Tyron Matthew thing, I hate it when, and I, I've shared this before on a, on a live stream. Uh, I, I hate, I really do hate when people compare defensive backs. He's the next Tyron Matthew. It's just never going to happen. I think first off, you know, Tyron Matthew made, so, in analytics, analytics views turnovers as lucky, as in like fumble recoveries, and it is uh, because the ball bounces weird ways. It's an oblong object. But for Tyron Matthew, the thing was, it wasn't the fumble recoveries per se. It was how smooth he did it. Like every time he made a turnover, he never struggled. Like his body just stayed calm. I remember when I when I would um when I played defense and there was a fumble on, on, on the ground, I would panic. I'd be like, oh my God, there's a ball on the ground. Uh I wouldn't be that dramatic, but you do begin to panic. And it was so interesting. It seems like time just stood still when he did this thing that was just ridiculous. So he made turning the football over an art. Also, I think something else is the quarterbacks now are so good. Like, just overall, the quarterbacks are just better. 
Go look at the huddle tapes of the 2022 quarterback class. Now, you know, you can always watch huddle tapes of quarterbacks, and, you know, their tape is always going to be their best plays. All right? But even then, if you look at the huddle tapes of the top quarterbacks of, let's say, a decade ago, now they, they're they just so much better. All these quarterbacks are so much better, whether it's seven on seven, whether it's the rule changes, whether it's any of those things. I, I just think the quarterback play, they are so good at not getting sacked now. It's going to be so hard. Um there still be a lot of bad quarterbacks. It's just it's you know that that really helped the LSU turnover machine, you know, in 2010 and 2011. You know, the, the the quarterbacks just weren't as good as they are now. Oh, King Ulysses, you're getting a neck brace removed? My guy. Uh that's crazy. Amicat says, I think Ricks can be Patrick Peterson good. I think that's a fair comparison. The only thing with that, though, is what you don't, when you really think about the great LSU defensive players. So Tyron Matthew was great. We never got to see the year three from him. So that's the only knock on his career, right? Is, you know, he left a seismic hole on, on the team. You know, LSU had three players in the past decade. Well, four. They had four defensive players in the past decade that gave you three years of elite play. So that was Delpit, Adams, Patrick Peterson, and White. And if you want to throw, you know, Jalen Mills started – all four of the years. I don't think he was as good as those guys. He was still really good. Also, Dante Jackson played a lot in all three of his years, and all those guys remain pretty healthy. Um, so, yeah, you know, if Ricks can stay healthy and have three elite seasons, his, his career will probably have a Patrick Peterson type of trajectory. Multiple disc replaced. Back to solid food. Oh. oh, yeah, Trey, that was such a great fumble recovery. You know, it, it, let's see here. I was actually looking at that play not too, too, too long ago. LeRon did stay all four years. Tredavious White. Did Tredavious White start all three years, though? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, he had he had two. Yeah. You're all right, Tony. You des- I deserve that. Trey White did get better as time went on. And he was a really good punt returner, too. Eric Reed, yeah, he's he's up there. It's just kind of, you know, when you're just spitballing, it's so easy to forget. Everyone that we named would be the best defensive back. At probably half the SEC schools of the past decade. I'm dead serious. Honestly, even, you know, Jalen Mills, who is on the lower end of the guys that we just mentioned would probably be, you know, the best defensive back. He'd be the best defensive back at Ole Miss. He'd probably be the best defensive back at Arkansas. It's interesting just how many that they had. Yeah, you know, yeah, Trey White was phenomenal. And he's been even better in the NFL, which is scary, right? DJ asked a question here. By the way, Trey, I didn't give you the opportunity to ask your question. So, Trey, you do get to pick – uh, the next topic. And Trey was the only one that did catch Big Al's awful yet awesome dad joke. Because Big Al, you know I'm a harsh critic of your dad jokes. 
You just sit there. Mm. Mick, no one ever talks about the pure lunacy of that play. It was such a wild play. And ironically, that that could have been Tyron's. That was probably like in his top three games. He was so unreal in that game. And even though, was that game played on New Year's Day? I'm trying to remember. Anyway, uh, that was so phenomenal. Yeah. I I kind of hate, you know, I know some of you guys are in limbo. I do know this personally. I know Jared is one of you, you know, with this UCLA stuff. You know, I, I hope you guys get to go to the game. Trey said, just keep riffing. Uh, Jalen Collins. It was good. Yeah, I don't. Let's see. Is he in this this I don't think he's in this discussion, but he was really good. He was really good. Um once again, he's probably, you know, top five DB at most schools. But I do agree with Clint. It is mm, those two and everyone else. Y- yeah, y- yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It, obviously, you know, you, you're factoring in one of those guys is a nickel. Another one of those guys are like a, a corner. So that's two different things. Then, you know, safeties is just a completely different thing as well. It's a different thing, yet it's not. It's the same position, yet it's not. Um, the same position group, not the same position. So, you know, Jamal was really good. Jamal played all three seasons at LSU started most of those games uh played 13 games as a freshman as a true freshman started two he was the first safety off the bench in game one um man it's it's hard to go against President Maul you know whenever you're looking at him and then you know was he better than Grant Delpit I don't know they were they're close Slightly different players, but the two are similar. It's interesting. Eric Reed's probably in the next tier of safeties. I mean, he's up there. Um, but I, 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 I would put Delpit and and Adams there. I, I think since the Peterson year, you know, it's Delpit and Adams as your two best safeties. Um, and then you know you you. A lot of those guys that played alongside him are really good too. So, you know, John Battle was really good. Uh, Brandon Taylor was even better. Brandon Taylor was, you know, just as good of a tackler uh, as those guys were. I wouldn't say Reed was a one play wonder. Uh, I'll say his play was probably the the biggest <laughs> play that any that any LSU defensive back is probably ever made. Uh, well, no, I actually, I take that back. The biggest play an LSU defensive back has ever made. There, there's a few of them that come off the top of my head. And we'll get back into current stuff. Uh, the first one that comes to my mind, obviously, you know, I, I think a lot of you remember uh, the Chad Jones bat down at the line of scrimmage, right? That was obviously a great play. Another great play was uh, obviously – Chad Jones, fumble recovery on the road against Alabama. Then on the next drive, uh, Tremaine Edwards had a nasty spin move, but we he didn't sack him. It was John Parker Wilson. He threw a perfect ball over Chad Jones, and Craig Stelts made the probably the clutchest hit you'll ever see uh, to win that game. But to me, the biggest play in LSU defensive back is ever made obviously you know you think about Stingley's game against Clemson was incredible his interception against Auburn before the half was so key so you think about Sting he's in that discussion as far as just 
clutch game-winning type of plays. But number one, I would give it to Chevis Jackson. So he had an interception uh, against Alabama, not that game, though. He had an interception against Ohio State, which he returned for a lot of yards. But um, there was a play. I don't remember the exact score. It was the second quarter. Um, and then we'll get into Big Al's OU and Texas comment. Chevis Jackson was beaten on a play by Terry Robisky. And the ball was thrown perfectly, and Robisky had it for a touchdown. And at the very last second, Chevis Jackson ripped the football out of his hands. And then Ohio State settled for a long field goal. So we tend to forget Ohio State was up 10-0 to on that game. That would have stretched their lead. I think the score was 10-7. to I don't remember the exact score. Uh, LSU might have been up 14-10. to But either way, Chevis Jackson made that play. And after that, the very next play, uh, I think a lot of you remember this play, uh, the iconic defensive play of that game was Ricky Jean Francois uh, blocking the kick. And Chevis Jackson uh, didn't win defensive player of the game. It was Ricky Jean Francois who did have a fantastic game. But the MVP of that game was Chevis Jackson. It should have been Chevis Jackson because that was such – an amazing play. We might not win that game if he doesn't make that play. And then after the block field goal, we drive down the field and Matt Flynn on third down hits a corner route to Devery Henderson. And no, it wasn't Devery Henderson. It was uh, early Doucette. I don't remember. No, it was Demetrius Bird. And, or was it Brandon LaFell? No, it was Brandon LaFell. It was Brandon LaFell and Brandon LaFell beat Malcolm Jenkins for the touchdown and we would have kicked a field goal if we didn't score the touchdown there. So that was such a crazy series of plays, and that was a 14-point swing, uh, all thanks to Chevis Jackson hustling. We go to Big Al's Super Chat here. What schools are going to be affected the most if OU and Texas come to the West and Bama and Auburn go to the East? Uh, very good uh, question. So let's let's start with this, Okay. The first thing before we dive into this, Big Al, is would you guys prefer, and I think a lot of you are familiar to this. If you're not, I'll link a video that explains this. How many of you would prefer the four-pod system, or how many of you would like an east and west of eight teams? What's up, Dylan? Um, let me know uh, in the comment section right now. Um, Mayhem Santana. How many of you, T, okay, you're a four-pod guy. If you're Once again, if you're not familiar with the four-pod system, I will link you a video. I, I want everyone to, to be on the same page here. Uh, Esteban, you like the... Uh, the interesting Blanche. I've gotten a lot of messages about what Blanche has said. A lot of you, probably the angriest messages I've gotten. I've gotten a lot of you saying, Carter, I, I want to still play Alabama every season. So here's the thing about that. You're still going to play Alabama a lot in a four pod system. Okay. I understand. And I would like to play Alabama every year as well. Obviously, that game means a lot to us. It means a lot to them. We have a bye week before each and every game or before each and every um, time we meet up with them. I think it's better for the conference, though, because with the 12 team playoff, you also got to factor this in as well. Um, even if we do play Alabama every season, there's still a high likelihood you're going to rematch them. Anyway, in the playoff. So I think every other year would be fine because if we do get to the scenario where LSU and Alabama are rematching a bunch or if um, Alabama and Georgia, re whatever, how the, however the, the conferences work itself out, there can be some matchup fatigue, right? It's kind of like some of your Pelicans fans, some of your NBA fans, the Mavericks visit the Smoothie King Arena four times, 
So it kind of cheapens it when, you know, Luca comes or Dirk comes or whoever. You know, you, you don't want matchup fatigue, right? But you also want more diversity in your scheduling formats. So the one thing I like the most about the four-pod system is that we get more of a conference. We can make every joke we want about the Big 12. The one thing that the Big 12 can say that every other conference cannot say is that every single year, the Big 12, which is actually a group of 10 teams, plays each other every year. And there is, you know, I am, uh, if you're an English Premier League soccer fan, there's a lot of, uh, not a whole lot of you in here, but what that sport can do to you, or just international soccer, is their scheduling format is so much better than American sports in that they do play everybody an equal amount of times. So, you know, that's the thing that excites me the most about Texas and Oklahoma coming over is that we're going to get so many freaking iconic matchups each and every year. And, and I think that's going to be great. I do. Uh, but it's, it's so interesting that I've gotten a lot of messages like Blanche. Got to give Blanche credit. You know, sometimes I don't appreciate uh, guys like Blanche, who is always there for premieres and is always hooking us up uh, with Super Chats. You know, Blanche likes playing Florida every year. And honestly, which matchup has been funner, right? Don't get it twisted. LSU beating Alabama and Tuscaloosa in 2019 was just as sweet as any other win. I thought the 2011 win would never get better. The 2019 win, even more so than the Clemson win, is the best win. It's the best I've ever felt after a game. And I wasn't even there. I wasn't really able to watch the first time around. Uh, and, you know, when I watched the re- – dude, I started getting emotional. I was like, oh, my God, this is wild. So what, what, what what's interesting, though, is even with that said – Florida is such an iconic matchup. You know, if you were to ask yourself, based on what we've seen the past five to ten years, how many SEC matchups have been more entertaining than LSU-Florida? And there's not many, especially if you take a look at the past two decades. There's just not many. Jared just earned himself a T-shirt. <laughs> Jared's always rocking his PHL shirt. And then Jared says, there's nothing else for me to do tonight, so I'm here. Well, thanks, Jared. 2011 was a... Uh, yeah, John would say that. 2019 was very nerve-wracking. Mo, Fa- Mo Funky says he likes the four pod systems. He said the Tide Pods. Mm. And you know what, Esteban? I feel the same way. <laughs> you know, there's a piece of me. Before the scheduling format came out, I said, okay. Um, I, I, I hate that we have to play Florida every season because it's so unfair. That LSU has to play Florida and Auburn has to play Georgia. Obviously, that's going to change here soon. Um, the schedule is going to have to change. So, big out to your initial point. I don't know if we're going to get the two division thing. I think the pods tend to have a lot of weight. Now, um, if they do an East and West, what would make the most sense would be to put Auburn and Alabama in the east, Texas and Oklahoma in the west. So two top 15 recruiters move over to the east and are replaced by two other top 15 recruiters. So, yeah, you know, I think I think that would be, you know, your your most common case scenario. So let me know if I answered your question, uh, Big Al. I do think 
the uh that the, the pod system is is what's going to happen. Ah, Jerry, that's so true. I think about that Florida game a lot. I, I really do. Out of all the games I've rewatched from 2020, that's the one I've watched the most. And, you know, what made the 2020 LSU team so interesting is none of the games were just normal. Like, really outside of Vanderbilt and South Carolina, those are the only two games where LSU played dominant football. Okay, Vanderbilt was bad, and South Carolina, we had, you know, all that extra time to prepare. But outside of those two games, and even that South Carolina game, every other game, LSU played in 2020 was all out chaos. And Blanche, thank you for a nice super chat. I appreciate you, my guy. So Blanche, guess what? You get to pick the next topic as we check in on our poll question tonight. Let's see. We're almost at 100 votes. Max Johnson, slightly better. There we go. T streets. That's a that's an interesting question. Let me let me get what Blanche wants to uh, to get to uh, really quickly. Um, but to answer, actually, I'm going to answer this really quickly. Would there any other teams? You know what? This would be um, my biggest thing. T. I would really like for the SEC to add more. And then create a promotion and relegation uh, type of system. That's obviously would never happen. That would be my dream, um, which is also an EPL or just international soccer thing. Um, so yeah, I think I think Clemson will have some uh, some rumors to it. Let's go to uh, Blanche and Rai Rai. We'll get to Emory Jones in just a second. Okay, can't wait to see what happens Friday with Emory's commitment. You should feel pretty good about it, Blanche. Not going to lie. What teams would you like in your pod? Good question, Blanche. So, obviously, in, in a the most entertaining pod to go along with geography would obviously be LSU, Texas A&M, Texas, and Oklahoma, right? That would be the most interesting pod to me. Now, I think if you factor in vitriol and all of that, I think (laughs) the most interesting pod would be LSU, Texas, Alabama, and Florida. If you want to, if you want to, as far as hatred and chaos and cultural, um, differences amongst fan bases i think that would be um (laughs) the most chaotic so once again from fairness aside chaos aside um or actually just judging based on pure chaos and entertainment value if you with a little bit of geography my dream pod blanche would be lsu um texas oklahoma a&m taking geography out of it i think Obviously, Alabama and Florida have been LSU's two most entertaining and looked forward to games. Auburn's had a quite quite a few of those as well. A and M, obviously, in recent years. Um, but man, I LSU and Texas fans are just not going to get along. It's just not going to work itself out. LSU is a fan base full of people that don't take themselves too seriously. Texas is the exact opposite of that. Now, there are some LSU fans that are uptight and can't take a joke, and there are some LSU fans that are downright um, lunatics and they make stupid comments. All SEC and just college football fans in general have those guys. But for the most part, LSU fans don't take themselves too, too, too seriously. 
Texas fans, especially the people that matter at Texas, the higher ups, they they can't get out of their own way, which is kind of weird considering the face of Texas is the most low key, down to earth, every man celebrity in Matthew McConaughey. It, it's so weird that uh, that that's the case, right? <laughs> But LSU and Texas fans aren't going to get along. I can't wait. <laughs> and here's here, here's a funny thing about the Texas thing, and then we'll get into some Emory Jones uh, chatter. And Ry Ry, honestly, you know, I take that back. The LSU Arkansas game does mean a lot to me every year. Uh, I grew up in Arkansas. All my best, a lot of my best friends live in Fayetteville, and um, and that game just means a lot. It really does. Now let's get into uh, some Emory Jones chatter. Um, you know, look, for me, Rai Rai, it's going to be really hard um, to not see him go to LSU. His four schools that he tweeted out photos of were very interesting. LSU, Florida State, Tennessee, and Arkansas. You know, all three of those programs aren't necessarily great. However, I, I would counter with that saying all three of those programs do have um, some some heavy offensive line ties. So Tennessee's had some good offensive linemen go into the draft. Arkansas had some really good offensive linemen go into the draft recently, particularly on the interior. And Florida State, their coach, Atkins, their offensive line coach, had some – you know, there was some steam to his name with LSU um, during the offensive line coaching search. So I, I get it. I don't, it's just going to be hard for me to see him go to one of those schools. And those may not have even been his top four. I, I just, it, he's, I think he's going to pick LSU. I really do. You know, Alabama's got a log jam of elite offensive linemen. You know, they got the Brocker Meyer brothers and JC Latham in this last class. They've got Booker out of IMG Academy already committed. Um, it, it's it's going to be hard for me to see uh, Emory Jones going to Alabama. AM's gotten a few offensive line commits. You know, I just think the path of least resistance and obviously the path of most celebrity is LSU. So I just have a hard time believing that this is just um, that that this is not going to happen. You know, I I, I feel pretty confident about this. Um, but once again, I'm not a huge crystal ball guy. These are 16 and 17 year old kids. I do get this question a lot. Where is so and so committing? I don't think there's no such thing as a dumb question. I really don't. Right. Uh, however, I, I, that question is the hardest because I do know recruits watch my channel and I don't, I, I want recruits to do what they feel is best. So yes, if Emory Jones does decide to go to another school, it's going to suck. If Emory Jones decides to go to another SEC school, that obviously would suck a lot worse, but so be it. Yeah, Michael B., that, that does make a lot of sense. Look, fans from all around, they dream of going to a game in Tiger Stadium. You know, we were talking about this, and this is what's going to make it great, Michael, if we were talking about, you know, SEC expansion. Um, the best thing about it is, in theory, we're going to have a heavier rotation of, of teams. We're going to have a far heavier rotation of, of getting to visit other stadiums. So, you know, Jared super chatted earlier. He's still in the chat now. Jared likes to travel and go to games, right? With this in play, you now have an excuse to go to a game in Norman, Oklahoma, and you will have more opportunities to go to Samford Stadium. You will have more opportunities to go uh, to, to anywhere in the SEC. You know, it, it, if you miss the Texas game, and let's be honest, 
Austin is incredible. Austin's a great college city. Austin has incredible food, incredible culture, an incredible uh, football atmosphere. Not going to lie. I've shared the story before as well. Another thing I'm really excited about is going to, um, and they actually made another good move. They named the stadium now after their two Heisman Trophy winners. It's, what is it, Williams-Campbell Stadium or Campbell-Williams Stadium? I don't remember. Um, You know, I'm... So I was supposed to cover the LSU versus Texas game at a pass and everything. And two days before the trip, they said, hey, we we already hired. There was a miscommunication. We hired someone else. Uh, we, we don't need you to go anymore. And that was before we knew what the 2019 team was going to do. And uh I'm not going to admit if I cried or not, because Austin was a city I always wanted to go to anyway. And, you know, when I actually visited Austin, it was crazy. It was awesome. So I, I think it's I think it's great. You know, you get to go to all these iconic stadiums even more. The food truck scene, man. Yes, dude. It, it, I mean, honestly, you know, it... I just I'm I'm such a foodie and Austin's food is just so freaking good, man. Esteban, do you have that on good authority? Okay, so Esteban bought three more booger bands and he drops two bold statements. Okay. He said Tykeist Crawford transferring to LSU in 2022. Okay, I like that. And Esteban also shouts out Sony Fanua. Very interesting. Let's see here. Blanche, let me know if I answered your question okay about the dream pod scenario. <sighs> I know, Big Al. Oh, my God. I was so sad. And honestly, you know, it's kind of like, all right, this this tends to happen as well. You know, so whenever you visit, like, an SEC city, everyone always says, you got to go to so-and-so restaurant. Sometimes, logistically, you can't go to every iconic restaurant. I've always found this to be true. So, like, Austin, Texas, their iconic restaurant is Franklin's, right? Franklin's Barbecue. Um, you know, Kanye West, presidents, so many different people go to Franklin's. And they have this long line, and it's probably incredible. However, you know, I, I, I didn't get to go to Franklin's. I went to a place called Terry Black's. Never heard of it. I just saw a barbecue place, knew I wanted some, and I just parked. Um, and I had to wait in a line. It was like a 10 or 15 minute wait. Some of the best food I've ever had. It's kind of like the same thing with, with, with Baton Rouge restaurants. There's just so many good ones. Right. Um, so yeah, Austin's one of those cities where, you know, I had some, and, and I'm a tough critic. Yeah. You just can't get in them. Right. And it, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, Torchy's is solid, man. I don't think Paris is in here anymore, but Velvet Taco is where it's at. Esteban, it is, okay? I, and I understand I'll get hate for that because, you know, and, and honestly, you know, let, let's say it was in Baton Rouge and someone, you know, called and said, hey, I want to go eat some fine Baton Rouge cuisine. <laughs> I'm taking them to Pluckers. <laughs> but if they really wanted seafood, you know, there's so many great places that you can go and they're going to go get seafood, right? Um, but yeah, you know, Pluckers is phenomenal. I'm not calling Pluckers is phenomenal. I cannot front about that. I, I like all the wing joints. I just like chicken in general. But yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm, I mean... So you're a hole in the wall kind of guy. 
King Ulysses, you know, I, I love that because I, I'm like that too because I hate, I hate it because obviously. So we started the live stream at eight instead of seven uh, because we, we had a doctor's appointment to go to, and while we were while we were there, I had to eat at a place that I couldn't get here. Um, and, and I, I get there and, you know, it, I, I hate, I, I really do hate eating at chains when I'm on the road. Like I like hole in the walls or like smaller name joints. It could still be a chain per se, but you know, I just, yeah, I'm like that too. Oh man. Let's see here. Um, <sighs> no, Trey, you weren't that late. <laughs> yeah, we had to. We we did have to start at eight, but everything was good. Yeah, you know, and and it's interesting. Like, what one? Like, have you ever gone to a chain restaurant? Like, a friend tells you, "Hey, you got to go to." this chain restaurant and you go there and it's not good. And your friend says, Oh, you went to the wrong location. No, every location needs to be consistent. Okay. I can understand some regression, but I need consistency. Yeah. You know, food trucks. OU's band is bad. Got to give the Golden Band and Tigerland a lot of credit. We don't have any Golden Band and Tigerland viewers. We have uh, Brendan Caldwell. Uh, he shares a name with another friend of mine who has that exact same name. He hadn't been in here in a while. He was a. Uh, it was in the Golden Band and Tigerland. Okay, King Ulysses. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I got a screenshot. King Ulysses with the most obvious statement of all time. All right, so we're gonna end the poll because Roger said I want to end the poll now. <laughs> okay, well we'll do this. Right, or I let, let we'll, we'll answer this question. We're almost two hours in. Max Johnson, 50 to 49, wins a poll. Interesting. We get some weird percentages on these polls. So as a Canadian, I want to ask, how is Chick-fil-A? Okay. So we'll do this simply. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, 1 being the lowest, how would you rate Chick-fil-A? Now, right, 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 do you, let, let you do this. Based on the food. Right, because we know Chick Fil A service is like just impeccable. There's not even a Popeyes in Yuma. I I don't know if I can live in a in an area with no Popeyes. Creek said I am out on the Chick Fil A question. Huh? <laughs> I understand. Creek, thank you so much. You were the first super chatter tonight. I appreciate you, Roger. That's the thing. Right, <laughs> uh, a, a split fan base. You know what? Uh, uh, what's interesting about that poll is, I mean, fifty to forty-nine. The the question was who is the who should be the starter? It's who had the better film in twenty twenty. Even though they're two diametrically different quarterbacks. It's kind of hard to say who actually was better. But anyway, let's help out our fellow uh, Canadian here. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best food. Once again, we're just judging the food, okay? And it's either breakfast or lunch. On a scale of 1 to 10, 
our Canadian, Rai Rai, who eats poutine for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Scale of 1 to 10. Let him know what's the best. Yeah, no one's given. Uh, no, a lot of you don't like this poll question. By the way, make sure you sign up for my newsletter. It'll release every Sunday. I think that we're going to go with Sunday. <laughs> I, I'm new to the newsletter thing. We only have one post. Raising Cane's ten Chick Fil A seven. I can roll with that. Rogers going seven for Chick Fil A. So here, here's what I'll here's what I'll say about it, right? Right? I I love Chick Fil A's breakfast. I like getting uh, the chicken biscuit with like egg and cheese on it, and their tater tots are phenomenal. I like, and obviously, the, just their food in general is really good. Um, but yeah, you know, I I let's see. Yeah, you know what I, I like? I like Chick-fil-A. I do. Do I like it better than Canes? Oh, that's tough. That's really tough. Canes, man. If you it, here's the thing about Canes. If you haven't had it in a while, it does hit a little bit different. I know, uh, Trey, I've only gotten like two or three subscribers to the Substack. <laughs> does the newsletter come with the funny comic section? I, you know what, I'm, I am, I am a stand-up comedian. I'm not an elite joke writer, and I'm also not an elite cartoonist. And uh, my brother was. My, my brother can draw, but I can't. Um, but yeah. Yeah, right, right. When when you come down, we will definitely, and I mean definitely, take it. Well, here's the thing: if if you and I are hanging out, I don't know if if you know Chick Fil A would be something uh, we get into. Let's go, Paris. She's back, but Paris, you missed out on the taco discourse. When are you and Hey Hey in here talking about? Here's the thing about Velvet Taco that I like a lot. They do have lettuce wrap, pescatarian friendly options. That's huge. I'm back. Who are some of the sophomores you think will break out this season? I freaking love this question, Paris, because it's interesting. The question that we uh, that we hear all the time. This is in Esteban. Thank you for signing up. I just saw your sign up. That's cool. This is this is what I hear all the time, Paris, and it dry it. It's crazy, right? We're always so enamored by not only recruiting, but the true freshmen. Who are the guys that can help out in year one? Ja, thank you. Which side of the ball dominates this season? Uh, ja, you would hope it is the offensive side of the ball. But we'll get to your question in just a second. Thank you so much, Paris. I appreciate you getting the Super Chat train rolling. Who are some of the sophomores you think will break out this season? I love this question because we always talk about who are the true freshmen that are going to break out, which every, and this is the case 12 times out of 10. It is rare that you get the best of a player as a true freshman. Okay. And obviously, you know, there, there are some exceptions to that. Obviously, you know, Justin Vincent is someone, but he, you know, um, who is his best, his first season. Right. Still, you know, it's 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 wild. Right. We never talk about the sophomores, the guys that are coming into year two. So obviously the definition of sophomore has changed because we had the pandemic year last year. So I think we should look at sophomores as second year players. So this is the class of 2020 which is a very interesting crop. You have a lot of guys like 
Jordan Tolls and um, Antoine Sampa and Josh White. Really talented, high-level, top 200 recruits that, you know, you hear, you hear some things from camp, but none of those three guys are guys that are like, okay, we are for sure going to see them play a lot next season. So let me pull up a full list. Um, let's see. I do think Jaqueline Roy has a lot of potential. Obviously, BJ uh, O'Jalari and Koi Moore. I almost said Joe Koi. <laughs> Koi Moore. All three of those guys played a lot last season. I think out of the guys that didn't play a whole lot last year, Dwight McLaughlin really has a good opportunity to play. You know, I think and we were talking about defensive back play earlier. You know, one thing we tend to forget about defensive back play, and this is going to go along with Jai, your super chat as well, because offenses play at a faster pace, and especially last season, LSU not only forced the most three and outs, their offense had the most three and outs per SEC stat cat. So that means your defensive backs had very irregular snap counts. Also, your defensive backs last season had a lot of guys get injured, a lot of guys, uh, some get ejected for targeting. You know, you would have uh, weird snap counts from different defensive backs. So, you know, it used to be your same DBs played the entire game. Well, when you play so many plays, and if you score really quickly, like LSU did in 2019 and in 2020, the plays that you play begin to rack up. So even if Dwight McLaughlin doesn't start, he's going to play a lot in the secondary. What's up, Tristan? Let's see. Oh, God, he's being bad over there. <laughs> I, I, I. I think uh, BJ blows up this year. Uh, kind of had to pause for a second. Um, I was like, "Oh, what, what kind of comment is this?" No, I, 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 I do agree with that. I do think Ojolari. It, it's all. I, I just always say Ojolari because the name is so phenomenal. Like Ojolari just rolls off the tongue. It sounds like a, an elite edge rushing prospect. So, Paris, out of the names that you listed, obviously, Jaqueline Roy is going to play a lot. We know B.J. O'Jalari is going to play a lot. We know Dwight McLaughlin is going to play a lot. All three of those guys are on defense, but all three of those guys will probably not start. So, it's going to be interesting because all three of those guys are going to be hungry to win a starter's job. Obviously, McLaughlin will not win a starter's job. Uh, over the two guys he's going up against. He'll be the starter next season, which is a good thing. And Jaqueline Roy, to me, he was the best defensive tackle in the spring game. Granted, he was going up against the backup offensive lineman. Still, he was special. And, you know, B.J. O'Jalari is obviously a very good talent. Offensively, a, a year two guy. You know, uh, one year two, uh, there's a difference. Coy Moore is going to be a key part of next year's team. I, I've talked about him a lot on this channel. Um, he puts in a lot of hard work, but at the very least, Coy Moore plays a very deep position. I think a guy who could take a superstar leap in year two, well, I, I'll put it this way. I think he's going to be a year three guy now, but the guy that would be very nice, and it couldn't be – more timely for this guy to step up to have a huge year two in his development is Marcus Dumerville, right? So you look at Marcus Dumerville, St. Thomas Aquinas. You can argue that is one of the greatest high schools to NFL pipelines ever, most notably the Bosa brothers. So he goes to this high school. That's a high school Julian Armella goes to. It's, it's, you know, uh, Doomerville was so highly touted. We were able to get him so late in the recruiting process, and we are, you know, still waiting. His spring game was very patchy. 
And I don't, I don't know if he's going to be year two ready, probably more year three. Um, but yeah, it would be very nice if Marcus Dumerville um, becomes Siren Black uh, overnight. So we'll see. Um, what's up, Christian? Good to hear from you. So let me know if that uh, answers uh, your question. And actually, uh, the lovely lady of PHL, hey, hey, <laughs> says her favorite player of all time is Keishon Butte. <laughs> and he is a year or two guy. I don't think Haley knew that. Uh, but Paris, that's a really good question. So, uh, if we were ranking the year two guys, obviously, you know, Eli Ricks is number one. Um, but as far as a breakout, man, it would be nice if, if Marcus Dumerville could be a guy we could trust in, in the trenches next season. <laughs> Boutte and Bug. Uh, Tristan. Resident Bama troll getting in early. So John makes an interesting comment. So we'll do this really quickly. So which side of the football do you feel more confident about going into next season? Type D for defense, type O for offense. Once again, which side of the football do you feel more comfortable about going into next season? Type D for defense, type O for offense, okay? What's up, Juwan? Gonna throw this out here. I guess Hey Hey is now the uh, the president of the Keishon Butte fan club. Ben says offense. Sam McCat says offense. Big Al says defense. Uh, Trey says offense. Ryan Ryan says defense. King Alyssa says defense. Mm. Trey, just shoot me an email. Once again, if you want a booger ban and um, shoot me an email with your address, Trey, you've already re reached uh, that threshold. Um, one for 10, two for 15, three for 20. Shoot me an email uh, once you get that payment in and I mail it to you. Once again, if... Um, if you get three for 20, you also get an LSU card. So let's see. I actually don't have any on me right now. Do we have some grouper fans? I brought Haley a piece of grouper back, and she said it's not good. I freaking love grouper. I don't have a pen. So, Jai, you believe defense? So, tell me this, Jai. You were the one that, that super chatted. Um, why do you think the defense will be better than the offense? Uh, right, right. Yeah. Right, right. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of your shipping. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, uh, one for 10, two for 15, three for 20. Uh, let's see. Also, with every order, you do get a. Well, actually, I don't want to. I don't want to give away the surprise. What's up, Kyle?
Let me see. I'll get my thoughts on this after John gives me his thoughts. Jaws is such a great name, too. Think of all the great Jaws, man. If you were ranking the Jaws, number one, number two would be Morant. Well, actually, no. Number three, well, actually, Ja Watts is number one. But if we we're rating the Jaws, number two is Morant. But who could tell me the number one Ja of all time? What's my mo- name? Like, legit, give me his name. Oh, it wasn't good? You don't like groupie? The sound had water all in it. Oh, because of the... I don't know. It was not good. I'm really disappointed. Well, it might have been from the ice that melted. It was so bad. That was my bad. I should have packaged it better. Hey, Bob. <laughs> Get it. Oh, hold on. I feel it. Everybody said hi. Almost. Because she's she's got to get better on camera. She will, <laughs> Carter. <laughs> I love her. Baby. I, you need Thank her. you, Mr. G. Look at Paris. Hey, Paris. We're talking about the greatest jaw. It really wasn't good? Mm-mm. Well, it's because the water got in it. No, the fish was nasty. Okay, well, we won't, I won't get that for you anymore. They didn't even have salmon? No, they didn't have salmon. But they had impossible. Oh, I could have got you in there. That would have been better. (sighs) I shouldn't have trusted fish from a burger joint. Here's Mama's. JJ. Everybody say hey to Z. Hey, Trey. Hey. Yeah, John Watts. What's my mother's name? Are you ready? Hey, big gal. She came back before she goes to bed. J-Lo back with Ben Affleck? What's up with that? I love it so much. Oh, my God. Benifer 2.0. I'm I'm not a Benifer guy. Why no love for A-Rod? He was so boring. A-Rod? My mother's. Babe, can you bring me an ink stick? Did you hear that? What's up with that? My mother's. Alex's dad got scammed tonight. Oh, he got scammed? Uh-huh. By one of those people that come and knock on your door about, you want a home security service? And she, he gave her their information? And got, looked at her router. And hey, he her gave IP. her the router? He gave her the IP? Oh, you yeah. never do. People, okay. This is very key. because my wait, mom, but wait, but wait. My mom does this. And parents are going to get. Ah, 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 ah. It's hurting. All right. Look, now you've got to be sweet, mama. J-Lo and Diddy is what America needs. You don't ever put your personal information. Buddy, you never that. put your personal information. You never put your... You don't let people come in and look at your IP address. Uh, you never do it. Here, it's amazing. Pop, pop what did you want? Just a fan. It, it's amazing how many... Like, 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 we need to let our older generation know this. My mom has gotten scammed. Okay? Um... Like, you can't, don't give away your, yes, King Ulysses, you don't give away your information. Anyway, we go to Paris to Super Chat. I'm sorry about that, Paris. Most interesting battle other than quarterback, I think it's running back and safety. So, um, John, let me know. I think the LSU defense will be far more improved than the LSU offense. However, I, I it is interesting that the LSU offense, we tend to think of them as way better than the LSU defense last season, but on a efficiency and points per possession basis, they were actually a little bit closer than we would probably think. And a large piece of that was the first, um, that Texas A&M game obviously, you know, tilted the scale. And then also the, and this is key, and, and this is very key. I also think the LSU... Offense is going to stay on the field longer because hopefully we'll have a better run game. Trey, thank you so much, man. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, Trey, I'm actually gonna hook you up with. Uh, there, there's been a few things I've been wanting to send you, my guy. Um, but yeah, I will send you that, Trey. You have been one of the most generous uh, viewers of the channel, and I'm gonna hook you up with a uh, super cool LSU card. God, Washington? Mm -hmm. D.C.? I'm just kidding. 
I miss it. I used to live in DC. Now we go to Paris's uh, second super chat. What's your social security number? Two eight one three three zero eight zero zero five. That is my social security number. Most interesting uh, position battle. Okay, so right now in the comment section, what is the outside of quarterback? What is the most interesting position battle for you? Okay, outside of quarterback. All right. Let me know in the comment section. Yeah, Trey, you, you shared before you're out in Washington State. Man, I want to visit so bad. I really do. Matt, what's good? Uh, Michael's running back. Paris, I, I, I tend, I think most of you agree, and it's interesting because um, I look at the. Um, so I'm able to see my analytics. And my John Emery videos do really well. A lot of you are so fascinated by John Emery's story. What's very interesting is we don't really know a whole lot about him personally, right? So we know he went through LASIK. We know, you know, the pandemic hit him really hard. We know he was a five-star recruit, committed to Georgia, flipped to LSU, Destrehan High School, um, which, you know, is a really good football program. So, yeah, we'll – We'll, we'll see what happens with with uh, John Emery. I think, Paris, I honestly think you're right about this. I do think most of the LSU fan base is most fascinated by the running back race. I really do think so. I think defensively, we have a really good idea of the – not necessarily who the starters are going to be, but we have a good idea of who the two deep is going to be. I think a lot of you feel more comfortable about the depth of the defense, period. You know, outside of quarterback, there is a lot of uncertainty as far as the depth of, thank you, of the other positions. Hmm. So, yeah. Here you go, Let's see. Mamas? Hey. Good night, night. No, ma'am. No, and, ma'am. uh. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Why is she biting? No, ma'am. <laughs> so, so, Paris, let no, me ma'am. know. Do you think, do you, do you guys agree? I would have to say running back. My analytics show me running back. Can't go in daddy's room. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay. No, Esteban bought three mans. No, ma'am. Rai, Rai, how many did you want, man? You know, I got gotcha. you. Rai making me shift ship to Canada. There you go. There we go. They're going quick, ladies and Gentiles. Alan, that is interesting. You know, offensive line Paris is also an interesting uh, position. Roman! What's good? I-10 Roman's in the building. Safety is an interesting position group. Oh, yeah, King Ulysses, you actually work in IPs. Yeah, right, right, that's fine. You know I got you, man. And Paris, do you want me to send you one? I got you. Um, let me see. Christian, you think the defense as well. I think a lot of you think the defense. Amacad said offense. Trey said offense. Quinn said offense. Ron said defense as well. Matt, I'd love some chicken, man. After all that Canes discussion, Canes, Pluckers. Man, I wish I could have that every day. <laughs> I would look pretty huge. Oh, well. You want one of these pairs? 
high quality bands for the bands. All right, all right, you're locked in, man. But yeah, you know, I, I'm a John Emery fan. I think he should be the starter. What about the tight end position? That's an interesting one too, Charles. You know, I, I like Cole Taylor a lot. I've always thought of him as a year three guy. The thing that the thing that that Cole Taylor will have to deal with, and this to me is 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 very key. Um, Paris, you can just super chat it on here um, if you want some 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 bands. And then, uh, Rai Rai, I already have your address. If you get a band, just send me your email address and, uh, or just ship, uh, shoot me an email with your address on it. Um, and I will happily, um, mail it to you. One for 10, two for 15, three for 20. Paris, you've given quite a much, uh, quite a good bit tonight. So if, if you just if you just want one, I'll just send it to you. Um, and I appreciate all your donations to everyone that has donated tonight. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. But if you do get three, you do get another LSU card. Rai Rai, uh, I actually gave away one of my favorite cards of my collection. It was one of our it was our big four thousand subscriber giveaway. Um, I gave away my autographed Thaddeus Moss card. Freaking loved it. That pink prism. It looked so freaking cool. All right, Paris. There you go. So, Paris, uh, just shoot me an email right there uh, with your address, and uh, we will send it to you. <laughs> we got some letter Kenny chat. I've never seen that show. I know, right, right. I, I'll tell you this, right. Uh, God, I love that Thaddeus Moss card. The card I'm, I'm going to send you this time probably won't be as good as that one. But I'll try. I try my very hardest. Huh? 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 I have more confidence in the offense, man. This is defense has such a hill to climb. You know, Ed Orgeron said something very interesting. So he said, Durante Jones, he said he's never seen a coach connect with his players more than Durante Jones. Now, uh, which is the exact opposite. The players had nothing in common with uh, Bo Pelini last season. And, you know, it's, it is it is interesting, right? So Durante Jones, this is his first big opportunity. And I I really do believe this to be true. And I'm, I understand sometimes as an LSU fan, you can just be optimistic about something and logically try and make something make sense when it shouldn't make sense. However, I must say, I love the idea of bringing in a new thinker to the defensive position. And the reason why I like it so much is you know there's something to be said about how difficult defense has become, right? What does anyone even know about defense? How do you stop the spread? You know, there is an iconic viral clip of Nick Saban comparing Offensive coordinators <laughs> to um, uh, to evil people, <laughs> as far as how good they are with the play calling that they do, and that's Nick Saban talking. I think it's more important now as a defensive coordinator. Um, and Trey, you 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 work in this line a field with with the anthropology where. When you work in a field like that, you have to go in knowing 
that there's more that you don't know than you do know, and things are always subject to change. What happens with college football coaches is college football is known to be this um, this set-in-your-way sport. The way you always do it is always going to work. It's who you are. And it's true. You should have some principles you stand by as a coach. However, those that do not understand that the game is so much different than what it was just a few years ago are the ones that I think are going to be left behind. So the one thing I really like about Durante Jones, one guy Durante Jones is going to get compared a lot to is Derek Mason, right? Because Derek Mason, his name was tied to the LSU job, and Derek Mason actually has experience uh, being a head coach at the SEC level, and he was a defensive coordinator at Stanford. So he's a very seasoned SEC coach, where Durante Jones is more of a seasoned NFL coach based on just recent history. However, if I had to choose between the two of them, obviously Durante's personnel and Derek Mason's personnel, they both have great players on their defense. I would much rather the guy who's going into this with no preconceived motion notions, and guess what? Derek Mason could be as well, um, but we know that Durante Jones is coming into this. We don't know what kind of defense he's going to run. We really don't. Um, you know, we who knows? He might come out and, and run Aranda's three, four principles. We, we honestly don't know. Um, I, I doubt that happens, but you know, I would much rather have that than someone like, you know, Bo Pelini is an extreme example, but just there's so many defensive coordinators and I'm not gonna lie. I was, I was wrong on this. So, you know, when, when the Bo Pelini hire was happening, you know, I was asked, I, I did a piece, um, on YouTube, which coordinators would I like the most? And Th- that piece went viral because, you know, when I did the piece, I was still with Chat Sports, and shout out to them, I love them. And I did the I did the LSU defensive coordinator piece for Chat Sports, and the video was one of my more popular videos because I was critical of Bo Pelini, and they were already starting to get um, the news that already started to roll that Bo Pelini was going to be the guy. And I was just so confident that it was not going to be good. He was number six on my top 10 defensive coordinator list. I had Randy Shannon up there, and his defense last year was not great. Um, And honestly, I, I, I really feel it's better to just have someone that is going to go into this with a new concept, a new approach. That's what ruined Jim Moore and Les Miles, absolutely. So, you know, we'll, we'll we'll see. Emma Cat, I don't think it, it's confusing. What I think can happen though is when you run hurry up, those mistakes can happen. Um but to me the most important thing a running back can do is go the right way, okay? That's the thing about uh, about a, a running back. If, if the running back doesn't go where the play is designed to go, it, it's it's dead in the water, right? So the most important thing you, you can do as a running back is go where you're supposed to go, right? But yeah, you know, sometimes I, I – and this is, this is a good point um, that I don't make enough – College football games are played so much faster than what they are in high school. And the games are so much faster than even what they are in practice. You can get caught up and not understand that, you know, there there are more plays. So what was interesting, and I actually cut this part out of the John Emery film study from earlier. Uh, what's up, Larry? Was... You know, John Emery was having a rough game against Mississippi State, but he was having a really good game against Alabama. He had the long touchdown, and he still made, you know, mistakes. 
So that shows you, you know, in football, because the game is moving so much faster now and it's play after play after play, you've really got to keep your head on a swivel. Um, you, re- It's so important. So, yeah, that's I, I think that should be a major takeaway from the film study from earlier. And I actually cut this out, too, as well, Big Al. Um, and, and part of it is because of the volatility to Darius Geis' name. Uh, because comment sections can get so bad when, whenever you know you bring up a name like that. But that's obviously one of the more famous examples. Darius Geis went the wrong way on uh, hatback dive. Power, however you want to call it. So, we'll, yeah, we'll see what happens. But yeah, Paris, make sure you send me an email and um, I'll get that band out. So, so far tonight, we have Trey, Esteban, Rai Rai, Paris, and Jared getting the hookup with the booger bracelets. Um, still got a few more. Jordy is sold on Max because of two good games. Been many QBs that have had two good games in regress. Yeah, it's true, Big Al. I mean, that's a Big Al. Alan, it's true. You know, regression's a very real thing. You know, one thing I, I would say about the Ole Miss game, okay, this is why the Ole Miss game is really hard to evaluate um, for, for Max. The Florida game, there's no other way around it. It's one of the greatest performances in LSU history, Okay. There was so much on the line for Florida. Um, you know, Dan Mullen was locked in, and his team was very undisciplined. And obviously, LSU got a lot of lucky breaks to win that game. Um, but Max Johnson was beyond phenomenal in his first ever start. The Ole Miss game did regress. Now, once again, it was still phenomenal for Max, considering you know the ball changed uh during the course of the game you know you had a dry first half and then a wet second half the same thing was true from florida so that shows you that kid is you know really seasoned it makes sense you know when you see uh his dad taking trick shots and (laughs) from so many different angles so ball handling is one of max's strong suits whether it's not turning the football over and you know not fumbling he's really good at it he's very skilled um but this is also a huge asterisk to that Ole Miss game was both of the coaching staffs were extremely distracted in that that week, the LSU Ole Miss game was played a few days after the early signing period ended. So, You know, obviously Florida and Alabama played a game, but they were locked in on that game as the SEC championship game. Both the LSU and Ole Miss coaching staffs, and once again, I don't have any behind-the-scenes sources on this. However, I I am led to believe that because that game was just going to be a game, obviously LSU wanted to finish 5-5. and That sounds way better than 4-6. and But still... LSU was probably more focused on recruiting and ending the the early signing period um, because that was obviously such a big time. You know, you you ask yourself this question. Was it more important uh, to make sure you you landed Mason Smith and you got Malik Neighbors? Was it more important to get those guys signed on for your future? Was it more important to win that game? So obviously, you know, that week was just so strange. You had – you know, the Ole Miss opt-outs, it was their their best player that opted out. So, yeah, you know, and, and most of Max's throws were to one guy. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll do a film study with, with Max Johnson in that game, and it'll, um, it'll, it'll give us a little bit more context. Um, Aaron, what's good? It's... Go, little dub CW34. I am not the goat. We all know who the goat is, right? The goatest of goat athletes. 
Gotta go with Joey Chestnut, baby. Let's go. Let's go, Joey. Uh, uh, uh. That's true, King King Alexis. It was just one person at one time of the field, but my my uh my major point though, if if your comment was about Elijah Moore, was that Ole Miss was, you know, that was such this last recruiting class was so huge for them. And obviously it was huge for, for LSU as well, but Ole Miss really needed to close strong, and they did, um, considering they had that one-year momentum with Lane. That's a good point, Michael. There were some, there were some bad, bad, bad drops. Um you know, obviously Trey Palmer and, and John Trey were the two worst. Um, so yeah, it's it's very fascinating. I agree, Aaron, and and it was important, but Ole Miss really needed uh, an incredible class last year, and and you could see why the. You know, they needed it. <laughs> they really needed to ride that lane momentum. Black Mamba, I feel good. Obviously, I'd feel better if Clyde or Jeremy Hill was back there. But, uh, yeah, just need one. Just need one to be a, a beast. Uh, if two or three of them become beasts, that's even better. You need one to be a beast, and then you need a good backup. So there you have it. Good win. I like it. Online's a little different. Uh, but once again, we still need a beast. Let's see here. All right, guys. We're two hours and 12 minutes into it. Normally, we would be three hours and 12 minutes into it. So uh, we'll do a five-minute warning. Once again, we'll keep this train moving all night if the Super Chats keep rolling in. Um, so if you keep the Super Chats, of Venmo's, the Cash Apps going, uh, we will definitely keep this party moving. Don't sleep on John Emery. I hope so. Yeah, that 2022 class is going to be a monster. Trenton, let's go. I hope you're right, Dan. I really hope you're right. How can you send me something? Uh, shoot me um, an email. Right there, Aaron, and I'll send you all the information. What you need to do. I get newsletter link. Let's go, Roger. I love it. Yeah, you know, IMG's offensive line. I know that's been really good for Alabama. And I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Black Mama. I think you're a Bama guy. Uh, Jay, dude, I would take crypto. Are, are you are you a crypto guy? I can, I didn't I can't believe we got into the two hours and 15 minute point of this conversation. I honestly, you know what, Jay, next week I'm actually only accepting payments in NBA top shot. That's the only, uh, I'm a non fungible token. <laughs> uh, Charles, that's a good question. I think LSU would like to get another tight end. It's interesting to see how this Jalen she dynamic plays out. If we're going to get an official dynamic to, uh, Announcement to see if he's gone. Um, 
Also depends on how the Jack Besh experiment and what, what's going to happen with Cole Taylor, Nick Stores, and all those guys. Um, but yeah, there's the kid. Um, who's the 2023 kid out of Newman? Ja with the Les Miles super chat. I love it. Oh, a monetary donation. Very. This is very easy. There you go. Or you can hit that little dollar sign. And, um, but Venmo Cash App is always number one. All right. Aaron, thank you. That works just fine as well. I'm haunted by Les Miles. I wanted him fire after the Natty game versus Bama. I was still feeling the effects of his overstay at LSU and LA. anyway. All right, John, this is, you know, a deep question, right? Yes, but it has nothing to do with on the field, but off the field stuff. So I might lose all my viewers because when we talk about Les Miles, you guys will want to think about him. Obviously, he is a stain on the university. What he did off the field was nefarious. I think the one lesson is obviously, and this is just a lesson in life, when people do evil things, you should obviously uh, fire them if they do evil things like that. So Joe Oliva tried to do the right thing. He tried to fire him. And, you know, unless you just covered it up, <laughs> they said no. And it's sad. You know, this is a university I care about a lot. I was at LSU the time Les Miles was there. Um, you know, this is why you should care. Because, and a lot of you do care. A lot of you are good people. The letters LSU, that's your team. You know, you, you represent that team. And you don't want... You know, there's so many friends and family members that each and every one of you have that don't give a you-know-what about football. But I guarantee you they know right from wrong and evil whatever. And, you know, LSU, they would have saved themselves a lot of not only trouble, they would have saved them a lot of wins and losses <laughs> if they would have just fired Les Miles um, after 2013. I don't necessarily agree with firing him after the national championship game. Um, but he, here's here's why Les Miles was such a bad coach, Ja. Um, what happens is coach in um, the crypto keeper, <laughs> uh, what, what makes – and, and this is this is how I view life, right? Um, I am not an end results thinker, okay? So, for instance, take this channel, okay? I could post some really explosive videos. Like I could say, I'm not even going to make up a false headline because it could be taken out of context and um, whatever. I could post just gargly muck just trash and get a lot of subscribers get a lot of viewers okay and i do do bold videos but every video that i do i try my best to make it worthwhile i try and balance what i think is newsworthy and what i think is not while also like for instance john emery wasn't in the news Earlier today, I did a John Emery piece just because I like watching him on film, and I hope he fixes his pass protection. I love John Emery. That's the kind of stuff that I want to do. I can do a different type of video and it get more views, but I don't think that that is necessarily sustainable, if that makes sense. Les Miles won a lot of football games by sheer luck, okay? And... Part of the problem with Les Miles is that when he was winning those football games, obviously the most famous example is the Tennessee game, but when he was winning these games, he thought that that was good. 
You know, we won the game. That's all that matters. And that line of thinking is very flawed. All right. And I know a lot of people aren't going to like me saying his name, but Nick Saban is not an end results thinker. You know, I see him talk about process and the process and the process. And I know it sounds cliche, but he really does live by that. And when you're always fixing your process, the end results will come. So, you know, there's so many things about the Les Miles era that I hated. Obviously, the number one thing is do the right thing. What really is hurting our program now is the handling of a lot of different things that Les Miles did and the covering up of it all. And obviously, there's going to be more investigation involving this. Whatever's going to come from this, it obviously isn't good, okay? So I won't comment any fur further the extent of the investigations. Um, but yes, that is by far the thing that hangs over the most. But the thing that a lot of you can see now as well is on the field, he was a disaster. And we tend to just think of the time management errors. Uh, guess what? If you actually played better football through the course of the game, the games wouldn't have been that close to begin with. So you think of all these ridiculously talented LSU teams. That 2016 team had uh, Jamal Adams, Leonard Fournette, Geis, uh, Will Clapp, Garrett Brumfield, um, all the, Dante Jackson. They had all these ridiculously talented players, Arden Key. And we beat Lamar Jackson that season, and that's great, but so what? You know, it's that was a waste. Well, we have a quarterback. So <laughs> did you list did you hear all those players that I, that I just listed? It it was wild. It was wild. So yeah, and I once again I don't want anyone to say what well, Carter thinks of himself as high and mighty content. I don't, right? I'm always I I am a bundle of anxiety after each and one every one of my videos, but and people that that do a lot of clickbait videos. Once again, every videos have every video that's produced has a clickbait element to it, um, just because that's how YouTube works. You got to make a video that people want to click on. Um, however, you know it, it can some people can get really extreme. So, yeah, um, exactly, John. It, it was no game plan. And I know some behind-the-scenes the behind the stuff about how bad team meetings were, how bad the game plans were. Uh, it, it was a lunacy. It was honestly lun lunacy. Yeah. And this this is something else that's interesting about, about Les Miles. By the way, Aaron, you did Super Chat, so you get a question. Uh, Aaron sent that $10 donation and uh, has not commented afterwards. I appreciate you, Michael. Thank you so much. And there's a lot of really good LSU content on YouTube. Um, I'm glad you watched mine. I really do appreciate that, man. Um But it, it is it is also very interesting, right? And th and this is this is what I freaking this is what I think about a lot as well. Okay, so we're two hours and twenty three minutes into it. I might write a book on this, right? It's something I'm really passionate about. If we actually, you know, live by that that maxim, right? In results shouldn't be the be-all, end-all, right? Because college football is a very win-and-loss-related business. Not all wins and losses are created the same way. Like, you know, what, what Bill Snyder did at Kansas State, you can make a strong case, is every bit as impressive as what Kirby Smart's done at Georgia. Both have been very successful. Both have won a lot of games. But Kirby Smart went to a state that, is an elite recruiter and Bill Snyder went to Manhattan, Kansas and, and built a power. So, you know, you, you can make strong cases 
for any certain type of coach. But what 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 I'll tell you, and I don't want this to be taken too wildly, is obviously Les Miles got really lucky in 2007. In 2011, he actually got really unlucky. So the Alabama rematch shouldn't have happened. It should have been Oklahoma State. I still don't think that Oklahoma State field goal, I still think that Oklahoma State field goal was good for those that remember that game against Iowa State. But what's really interesting was that 2017, okay, we we always bring up the fact that the 2007 LSU team lost two games, okay? And that's true, okay? And they did lose two really close games. They lost to Kentucky on the road in triple overtime, and uh, they lost to Arkansas at home in overtime as well. Um, However, we look at that as two really close losses. But what I like to do is, if you're a championship team, how often did you dominate? Okay, How many games were you dominant? And what made the 2019 teams and the 2011 teams so good is those teams dominated. The 2003 team was dominant defensively. Offensively, not so much, but at least they were dominant defensively, like really dominant. The 2007 LSU team was really, really good, okay? Not taking anything away from them. The 2007 LSU team, though, did not dominate opponents. And that was a coaching thing. It wasn't a player thing. They had a lot of good players on that team. The 2007 team was not properly prepared for a week-by-week basis. And the perfect example of this is the 2007 LSU team began the year with two of the greatest performances you'll ever see an LSU team have. Okay, so they started the season destroying a Mississippi State team under Sylvester Croom that went on to have one of their better seasons in Starkville. All right, a really historic season. We blew the doors off of them. Then the next week, LSU played Virginia Tech and blew the brakes off of them as well. You can make a case Tyrod Taylor was one of the better quarterbacks that LSU faced that season. But for the rest of the season, okay, the um, the other 12 games, LSU did not have a game where they were even close to that level of dominance. In fact, uh, if you look back to that season, LSU trailed by 10 against Auburn. They trailed by 10 against Florida. They trailed by 10 against Alabama. They trailed by 10 against Ohio State. And they won all those games, okay? That is a miracle to win all those games. Then you had to win the Tennessee game on a pick six. Yeah, and that was with the backup quarterback, but still – And obviously, you had that the ridiculous amount of luck to get into the championship game. But to me, that's that season was chaotic. You can't control what the other teams do. The biggest myth of that team, though, was, and that is on the coach. You cannot tell me that you play two ridiculously amazing games. And I was in Tiger Stadium for that Virginia Tech game. That was ridiculous. I, I was I was blown away how dominant that LSU team was in those first two games, and then the rest of the season was just I don't know. We didn't. It, it, we still won. We still played fine. We still played good enough to win. But in all those games where you trail by double digits, and honestly, if you look at the teams that LSU trailed to. That Florida team was good. That Auburn team was eh. That Alabama team, it was a Saban team. They were talented. Ohio State was a national championship team. I get it. But still, if you get what I'm saying.
But anyway, I'm I'm sorry if I went on about that. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate you. But yeah, Amicat, it's it it made no sense. It the whole and I understand, you know, going PHL dues. What's good, Cliff? Going to and get. I understand. I I get it. You should just be happy you won the championship. And I am. And I'm not dumping, you know, any type of, of you know, I, I think most college football fans would agree that you are fortunate to be the only two-loss national championship team. I don't really care about that, right? We want it all. That makes me happy. The thing that, that I still think about, though, is we should have – We, we should have played even better. That team, the reason why that team won so many games is because they had so many senior leaders where when you get down by 10, you don't get discouraged. Um, you know, that Matt Flynn, you know, but before, before Joe Burrow, um, you know, took over, you know, the greatest performance by an LSU quarterback I think ever was Matt Flynn in the Auburn game. Um, obviously, we think about the Demetrius Bird throw, which is incredible. But if you go back, and I actually rewatched that full game a few weeks ago. If you go back and rewatch that game, Matt Flynn's four best wide receivers um, that season were early Doucette, uh Brandon LaFell, Demetrius Bird and Terrence Tolliver. All four of them had a bad drop in that game. I mean, right in the numbers. And one of those drops, Brandon LaFell scooped up into the air and just kind of tossed it to the defensive back. Now, he made up for it. He's a great player. I'm only bringing that up because Matt Flynn still threw for over 300 yards, his first ever 300-yard passing game. And won a set game. And then the next week, Alabama game happens. We're down by 10 in the third quarter. Matt Flynn pulls us out again. And D Bird. So, you know, that team had such great resolve. Who cares if if you it was smoke and mirrors to that final point? Well, I, I kind of do because it was foreshadowing how you can still be a bad coach and win a lot of games. A uh, little dub CW three, four. What's your final take on the QB starter? I, uh, I haven't made a final take. I still have max just based on my uh, analysis slightly as a QB one slightly. I don't have any inside information over who's going to start. Um, but yeah, we'll see. So my final take, I, I still have max, but it's not my final, final, final take. Exactly. I'm a cat. And, and that you perfectly stated my point here is, you know, the way if you beat down two games like that to start the season, there should have been at least one more game that year. You know what I'm saying? At least one more game that year where we did that to someone. Now, once again, all those teams LSU played had some NFL players, and there were some really good teams, but you can't peak like that against two teams that were good and just not ha- it it really is unfathomable unfathomable it it's so it is so strange whenever you look back at it it's like god you know but yeah Yeah, exactly, Roger. If you're going to make a list of the top 10 LSU games of all time, yeah. I mean, look, I, I'll put it this way. 
the top 10 most entertaining games of all time. Les Miles has, at at the bare minimum, six of them. Bare minimum, entertain, just pure entertainment value. Les Miles has at least six of them, if not more, if we're just going by entertainment value. Obviously, you know, the most entertaining ending in college football history. Um, you know, for, for Allen, uh, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Obviously, you know, the bluegrass miracle will always be, you know, the, the thing. And third and 17 and Flynn to bird. But to me, the most iconic ending of all time will always be the Tennessee game. I, I, and notice, iconic isn't always a good thing, right? It was a good thing, but it wasn't a good thing, right? But that game, you will never, you will never, we, we can, you could live, guess what? There have been other Hail Marys, miraculous Hail Marys. Um, there have been other third and 17s. Now, ours were better. I could argue the Bluegrass Miracle Hail Mary was just so insane with the fans on the field. And the third and 17 was the best third and 17 ever. But there have been others. However, you can live, yeah, you can live 20 lifetimes and you'll never see what happened with LSU and Tennessee. That's what I mean by icon. You'll never see it. You'll never see it. You'll never see it. And that is, that doesn't include the fake field goal bounce that ended with Terrence Tolliver from Jarrett Lee to win the game. But honestly, you know, the Tennessee game. But that's the thing. Horrible clock. Man, and it, it, what made that Tennessee game so great was it wasn't just that. LSU burned at least one more timeout on that drive and still had a delay a game penalty and still had to complete a third and nine and a fourth and 14 on that drive. And on top of that, after the penalty, if you go back and actually watch it, I remember because uh, I was at LSU at the time, I was on the field. So I was on the, I don't remember exactly where I was on the field. This is where not having camera phones and all that. I was just taking all of it in. I remember seeing all the LSU players just hearing I just remember hearing F-bombs and all this stuff going on. Just the pure change of emotion. But the most, one of the more iconic points of that Tennessee game was if you go back and watch the play, the left side of the offensive line did not fire off the football. Okay, and I talked to Joseph Barksdale about that. He could not hear the snap. So, um it wasn't just him, though. The left side of the offensive line didn't move because a false start penalty would have knocked you back five yards. So Nick Revitz was a walk-on linebacker for Tennessee. He actually shot the gap, and Stephen Ridley made a miss and still barely got into the end zone. One of the most underrated runs of LSU in LSU history. So... The game started with like Justin Jefferson, 80 yard touchdown. And we really didn't do anything the rest of the game. We got a fourth and one stop by Kelvin Shepard. Then we took over flip flopping quarterbacks, Jarrett Lee to Terrence Tolliver for a third and nine and a fourth and 14. You drive down the field, you switch the personnel out. Then it's on the one yard line. Then, you know, he's my friend and I finally mentioned his name. We get the snap, the most legendary snap in LSU history. We get the the T Bob snap, and then you know we get the uh, <laughs> Tennessee having not twelve, thirteen players on the field. Okay, huh? Huh? Ah. I love it, man. 
I'll never, I'll never forget it. And to be on the field for it, it might just be that. It might have just been I was on the field. I still can't believe that game. Exactly, Ryder. I, I, it makes no sense. That game makes no sense. <laughs> How do you win that game? You shouldn't win that game. You shouldn't. We're playing a Derek Dooley Tennessee squad. Mm. Rid was underrated. Bennett. Go Tigers. I love it. Welcome to the chat, Bennett. If this is your first time, welcome. Jerry Lee was clutch, man. He was clutch. Throw a lot of pick sixes, but guy, he was clutch. Um, no, he was he was really clutch. So a lot of big throws in his career. A lot of those to Tolliver too. Tolliver was clutch. Uh, yeah, I think I think it was a fourth and fourteen, and they had to blow a timeout on a dead ball. I mean, it was so bad. Alpha Blue is really solid too. Underrated Alfred Blue Run was the uh, 2011 game against wasn't Jacksonville State. It wasn't Western Kentucky. It was someone else. But we were struggling. It, that was something else about Les. You know, and, and that was that was so interesting because that 07 team. You know, we're we're talking about not dominating. If you remember correctly, now we ended up winning the game comfortably. So you can't complain too much. But if you remember, you know, we played Tulane in the Superdome that year. And we had the cool purple jerseys with the white helmets. By the way, you guys went off on the community post this week on YouTube about the uh, purple helmets. But anyway, that Tulane game, yes, they had Matt Forte, but still. That Tulane game was 9-7 to seven at half. Nine to seven. We have to sweat that one out. Yeah, Jerry Lee was a good dude too. I, I knew Jerry. We lived in the same complex. Yeah, Jerry Jordan Jefferson, eighty yards untouched <laughs> for the first. Season. Once again, the, the less it's unreal. But um, but anyway, guys. Um. We're going to sign this off, but if you do super chat, I don't mind. I'll, I'll keep going. I just dripped some water. Mm. Let's see. We'll end this thing at two forty-five unless we get any super chats. So go ahead and get your questions. We'll rapid fire. Um, a few answers. Let's see here. Oh, did I miss out on this? Let's see. Let's look at a few card auctions here. Nothing too wild. Did I cut myself? Ugh. Mario, I think uh, Ed Orgeron's going to wait till the day of the game. I really do think so. Lead to Tolliver in the swamp. Once again, Terrence Tolliver was so over, uh, so underrated. That game against Florida wasn't just great. He was lighting up Janoris Jenkins. (laughs) 
All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for making this live chat so much fun. King Ulysses, I hope the neck brace uh, extraction goes well, my guy. I hope it went well. And uh, we will see you guys tomorrow. I don't even know what the video is going to be about tomorrow. I think tomorrow some big breaking news is going to happen. I just hope it's good. It is. Oh, yeah. Really quickly. If you haven't already, it's free. Sign up for our sub stack. We'll not steal your information and sell it to uh, advertisers. Unless it's pluckers when they're advertising. Then I'm selling all you guys. I'm kidding. Uh, that is also where you can uh, get your PHL shirt. And uh, I got some bands I got to ship out. Let's see here. Well, I guess it is power hour LSU. Boom. You be blessed, Kenneth Charles Amicad. Let's go.